Axel attended high school at the Werner Heisenberg Gymnasium in Heide, just south of the Danish border. And you might think that attending the Werner Heisenberg Gymnasium would be inspired to a career in quantum mechanics. But I remind you that Heisenberg's 1923 PhD with Sommerfeld was not on quantum mechanics, but on fluid instabilities in addition to hydrodynamic turbulence. And evidently that is what inspired you know, Axel. Um, he moved a few miles south for college in 1986. He received his diploma from the University of Hamburg, where he worked on uh, the hydrodynamics of convective bubbles. And in 1990, he received his Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Helsinki in Finland on the solar dynamo theory. Then he was a postdoc at Nordida in Copenhagen, Denmark, and the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder, Colorado. He spent a few years as a professor of applied math at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, so that was North Sea in here. Um, and since 2000, he's been professor of astrophysics at the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics, or Nordita, uh, which in 2006, Nordita moved from Copenhagen to Stockholm, so Axel moved from Nordita, same position, different address, uh, where his address currently is Hannes Altvang's vague, and you may remember Hannes Altvang is a Nobel laureate, very angry Nobel laureate, I have to say, I've met him a few times, uh, who invented MHD. Um, and Axel is now a professor and deputy director at Nordica, but currently he's at the KITP in Santa Barbara in the program on turbulence and astrophysics, so that's how we got him for the team price. Um, Axel published over 400 papers on everything from magnetic dynamos and stars and galaxies, magnetic turbulence and accretion disks and the interstellar medium, formation of magnetic field and inflation and electroweak phase transitions in the early universe, and even astrobiology and the origin of candidness and biomolecules. Uh, Axel is the originator of the widely used pencil code for compressible MHD simulations which has been cited in over 650 papers so the last count, I think. And today, Axel will tell us why our astrophysical plasma is always magnetized. Thank you, sir, for your very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the audience for joining me on this uh, adventure to uh, learn about the universe and the magnetic fields uh, that is pervading much of interstellar space and the entire universe. I was very impressed uh, by the detail uh, which you do have collected, and, uh, and there's nothing else I can imagine uh, was missing there. Magnetic fields really are in uh, many of our calculations of uh, modern astrophysics, as opposed to like 30 years ago, uh, where magnetic fields were sometimes regarded as some real speciality that you would not necessarily need in many of the calculations. But nowadays we have realized uh, that magnetic fields are not only um, no longer unexplained, instead we do understand why magnetic fields are there. And in fact, we have realized that they are actually present almost everywhere. There's hardly any uh, location in the universe where magnetic fields are unimportant. They might exist, our Earth, of course, our stellar surface, our Earth's surface is, of course, a place where there is um, MHD not playing any role. And that's because of the very poor conductivity. And so the only thing that plays a role there is the displacement current as opposed to the actual current. And that's why we have radio waves being the only relevant phenomenon at the, at the Earth's surface. The understanding that magnetic fields are present in the, in the sun, for example, came back by uh, measuring the Zeeman effect. And so here you see the lines. Uh, this is a position here, uh, a, a picture uh, where arc seconds is the position on the surface of the sun. And so here you see different wavelengths in the horizontal direction. So different positions give you locations where you have uh, dark lines, uh, which correspond to the locations where sunspots are existing. But then you see uh, polarized light and you see that the light uh, becomes split into two different lines. And so that is indicative of the uh, three different lines altogether. That's indicative of the presence of magnetic fields and the strength of this magnetic field in these sunspots 
was early on in, since 1908 uh, already measured to be on the order of uh, around 2,000 cows. So that's strong. Uh, comp uh, we just hardly have such strong fields as anywhere else in our stellar planetary system. In the 70s, uh, it has been noted that also spiral galaxies, external spiral galaxies, do host magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields uh, tend to be aligned with the spiral arms. This can be measured by measuring uh, the linear polarization, and the linear polarization shows an alignment with the direction of the, uh, of the arms. This is an outcome of these kind of measurements. And here you see in the background a picture of synchrotron emission altogether on the entire sky. Much of this is dominated by synchrotron emission, which of course has to do with the presence of magnetic fields. And the presence of magnetic fields electrons spiral along around field lines. And so you would have this effect only in the presence of sufficiently strong magnetic fields. But where do they come from? And in the last 50 years, it has uh, been without any doubt understood that these magnetic fields really are amplified. And they are amplified to levels that are comparable to the strength of the kinetic energy in all these different bodies. In the sun, we have our convection zones. They are, uh, the convective motions have a certain kinetic energy and the magnetic field is comparable to the kinetic energy on average in the in the sun. Where exactly in the sun it, it's located is still a very much an open question. And the same is true of uh, external galaxies and our own galaxies. In our own galaxy, we have turbulent motions, which is driven by stellar explosions uh, and nuclear uh, supernova explosions. Uh, that is one of the sources, one of many other sources that contribute to turbulence on uh, relatively large scales, the typical uh, length scale of turbulence is on the order of um, uh, 70 parsecs approximately. Here we see the galactic disk that of course is uh, governing much of the uh, emission, but there's also a lot of emission on many other locations. I will talk about uh, various examples, but then I will also talk about the ubiquitous of the uh, magnetic fields in uh, various different astrophysical settings. And I will claim that the concept of ordinary co uh, goal of turbulence really does not make much sense anymore because uh, the magnetic fields will be generated inevitably. You cannot avoid this and magnetic fields will always be present. Some part of the kinetic energy of the Goal of like turbulence will be converted into a magnetic field and it will also exhibit something like a cascade. And so you really have a mixture between what one might want to call Kolmogorov of turbulence and uh, MHD turbulence. The key word is dynamo theory. And the dynamo is uh, something that is familiar for the last almost 200 years from technical engineering physics. There's two different concepts of a dynamo, but let me explain first of all the, the dynamo as opposed to the opposite of a motor. In a motor, you have an, a source of electric energy, plus sign here that leads to a current along this loop. But then you also have an external magnet, and that is denoted here by north and south poles, and between those, you have a magnetic field. So we are not explaining, even in this case, not explaining the origin of magnetic fields because we do have a permanent magnet in both cases. But it can lead to motions in this case. So you have a, um, a current J that flows along the conductor. You have an external magnetic field B that leads to a Lorentz force, J cross B, which pushes upward this conductor in this position and pushes it downward down here, that leads to the rotation. But now we can invert this concept. You could imagine now, and I use the same picture, but with opposite meanings in all respects, 
where you have an external source, which leads to a velocity driving. Imagine an old fashioned bicycle dynamo where you do have the motion of the wheel and that together with this permanent magnet is now leading to a induction electromotive force U cross B. And U cross B uh, points along the direction of the wire and therefore leads to an electric uh, current. And that can source the light lamp, the light bulb in your bicycle and many other things. But this is not, of course, the dynamo that we have in astrophysics. And the reason is that we really need what is called a self-excited dynamo. A self-excited dynamo means that also these permanent magnets have to be replaced by electromagnets. And then you really have, don't have any permanent magnetic fields. So you have electromagnets. Inventing those was not straightforward in those years, in the in, uh, 1800s. And uh, once they were invented, it was possible to produce much, much more powerful uh, electric generators. This was an important discovery uh, that led to much of the industrialization in, in those years. As far as astrophysics is concerned, uh, this concept was somewhat naively incorporated then by Lamor, who thought that the magnetic fields in sunspots must be generated by some kind of external source because Unlike the Earth, there is no, uh, the, the magnetic fields in the sunspots, of course, was uh, uh, changing. Uh, this discovery of Lamos goes back to the year 1919, which was after Hale discovered and, and saw that the orientation of the magnetic field changes with the 11 year cycle. So you really have a 22 year cycle in the sun. But Lamo didn't have any mathematics in this um, imagination. It was really a reasoning only. And uh, there came back uh, a, a big uh, shock to the community when, or to, at least to him in those years, when uh, Cowling discovered that on very straightforward, simple grounds, one can show that magnetic field generation from a axi, uh, from, from any fluid motions can never produce an axisymmetric magnetic field. This is what is known as the Cowling anti dynamo theory. So the magnetic field cannot be axisymmetric, unlike what we actually see in many of the planets. Saturn, for example, has an almost perfectly uh, dipolar magnetic field. The Earth has an inclined dipole, the sun's magnetic field is not really a dipole, but there is higher order multipoles and it's a more complicated structure. But it's just, uh, by and large axisymmetric. What he didn't emphasize very much was the fact that the important reason why his theory didn't uh, really describe what is going on in astrophysics is the fact that non axisymmetry deviations from the simple large-scale motions are critical and important. And because we have, I mentioned turbulence so many times, turbulence, of course, is always extremely irregular. These are irregular motions. And once you have these irregular motions, dynamos become ubiquitous. And this has been possible to demonstrate using numerical simulations over the last 30 years. So we have now seen how the dynamo works, but the actual proof of that it really could work was done by Herzenberg and uh, Bacchus in the years uh, in the year 1958. 1958. This was after Parker's important discovery of what is now called the migratory dynamo, which is uh, the correct explanation many of us believe stood for why the magnetic field of the sun is, for example, exhibiting cycles and why it shows a migration of the magnetic field towards the equator. But the details of this theory are still, even at this point, an open question. The uh, reason, and I will discuss this in a moment a little bit in more detail, why Parker's theory was not immediately getting traction really was the lack of the detailed convincing mathematics. And this was crucial 
because of this anti-dynamo theorem. If you have a calculation that is a bit of hand waving, you are immediately not sure whether you missed something. And that was the worry, of course, which led to the uh, community being careful and not accepting this uh, at the time. And it was really only with a more rigorous concept, which was called the mean field treatment, which simplified the mathematics by taking these three-dimensional motions and averaging over suitable correlations, which allowed you to develop a theory that one could solve analytically and that led to realistically locking magnetic fields. One of the things that was missed in that year was uh, the idea that also a small scale dynamo can exist. And that is a relevant concept in understanding why magnetic fields are really so ubiquitous. But the concept of a small scale dynamo, even though it was developed in 1968 already in, um, by a Russian scientist, was not uh, understood in the West as, as a real breakthrough, or was not even understood much at all. Uh, in the 1980s, for example, the first numerical simulations really reproduced what he predicted, but there was no connection with this original reference. This is a bit of a delay. <clears throat> Often, one would like to have uh, some understanding of the magnetic field evolution, especially in a dynamo, based on pictorial illustrations. Uh, there are uh, pictorial illustrations, but they are very of a very limited use. And so here's, for example, one of them. One imagined uh, that the Earth's magnetic field had convective cells that are mostly uh, aligned by the rotation axis. And so if you calculate what I should explain, the Earth has um, actually also fluid motions. In this case, the motions comes from the presence of iron, of an iron core, which in the outer half is, elect, is, uh, is uh, liquid. So it's liquid iron as opposed to the inner core, which is solid iron. So the liquid iron is electrically conducting and is uh, reproducing similar phenomena that we otherwise reproduce in plasma motions, which are also electrically uh, conducting. So this is a picture of the outer core here. And uh, this, uh, as it says here, here's the inner core where there's no motions. Uh, the outer core is convecting, but it may not be uh, convecting from the heat excess in the inner core. There is a little bit, but it's mostly, so many people believe, uh, driven by compositional convection, which means that uh, this uh, uh, the uh, iron is being is gradually uh, solidifying and then settling at the bottom of the of the core, at the bottom of the of the outer core. So this is uh, convective motions, and those velocities are very, very small uh, compared to the very rapid, by comparison, speed of the rotation, which is one day. So therefore, uh, these motions are very strongly controlled by the presence of the Kuriles force, which leads to these funny motions. But the first simulations were done by uh, Roberts and Glatzmeier. Uh, and those motion, those uh, magnetic field illustrations don't really look anything like that. And so if I wanted to somehow give you an explanation of why the magnetic field really actually grows, I wouldn't be able to do so because everything is really just a mess. But it does work. And there are analytic theories, but they are of statistical nature. And so that explains why having a simple-minded picture you can do, but it's really of no use. Uh, it could even lead to the wrong explanation of certain phenomena. The magnetic field of the sun, by contrast to the Earth, it has a special quality. It is a magnetic field that is changing every uh, 11 years, from plus to minus, and so 22 year cycle. So in order to understand that, it is actually meaningful in this case to average over the toroidal direction. In that case, you define automatically a mean magnetic field. I will not go into the details of this, but I want to motivate 
why in such a case it really actually makes sense to average over the toroidal direction. If you do that, uh, the magnetic field that you actually observe at the surface of the sun, which is in mostly in the, term, in the form of sunspots of 2,000 Gauss, it leads still to a non-vanishing average. But the average has a much, much smaller strength. It is on the order of between plus and minus uh, 10 Gauss, maybe up to 30 Gauss, much, much less than the magnetic field in some of the sunspots. So by averaging, you lose a lot of what is otherwise an impressive outcome of the observations. You lose the detail in this, uh, but you gain from this a systematic overview. If you do that, if you plot the magnetic field as a function of latitude or co-latitude or the cosine of co-latitude versus time, you see that there is a change of sign uh, plus minus, plus to minus at, this, at similar locations uh, after 11 years, and then again to a plus. This is exactly the 22-year cycle over which a similar structure is being reproduced. You see also a lot of variations motivating, again, the fact that the magnetic field really is highly fluctuating. Already the magnetic field in the sunspot is part of that, but there's many, many more contributions to this fluctuating magnetic field. Such a diagram is often called a butterfly diagram because a much, much simpler way of getting something like that is by showing just the location of sunspots at the surface of the sun. Again, um, you have a very, very detailed uh, location of the, of the position of the sunspot on the surface of the sun. They have been recorded uh, since uh, Greenwich Observatory and even before that already in Paris and many other places, which is important because there was a time called the Mount Minimum when there were not many observations, but there were at least some, and they were very, very important in order to understand, for example, this Mount Minimum. So this is called a butterfly, di butterfly diagram, and, uh, and we see that the sun's magnetic field is governed by a spatial, temporal, coherent magnetic field, which is quite remarkable. So this one is not a turbulent, not just a turbulent magnetic field, but also a turbulent magnetic field. And now I hope I first once. <laughs> yes, now I hope. So the understanding, the correct understanding, went back to Gene Parker. When Gene Parker in 1955 uh, uh, was trying to understand the uh, magnetic field origin. He was doing it by physical reasoning more than um, mathematical rigor. And, but it was correct, actually, uh, but it was difficult to understand or accept by the rest of the community. Let me briefly lead you through that idea. The idea is you start off with a large scale magnetic field which goes in the poroidal direction from the, uh, it's in, the polo, in the meridional plane, from uh, north to the equator in this orientation. So you have then at the equator, you have or close to, in the northern hemisphere, but close to the equator, you have a magnetic field and that points um, that would then be uh, dragged by the presence of differential rotation. In the sun, we, have, we know from Helios seismology that the rotation of the sun is not uniform. It's not a rigid rotator. The uh, the sun is differentially rotating. There are locations where there is a positive gradient. There are locations where there is a negative gradient, mostly near the uh, surface. This is called the near-surface shear layer. And there the gradient is negative. If you now imagine uh, such a differential rotation in a highly conducting medium, then the fluid would drag the magnetic field line along with it. And this was much of Alvin's uh, concept at the, at the time. Uh, that uh, led to this understanding. And so the orientation would be such that the inner parts are rotating slightly faster, uh, faster than the surface, which is here. And therefore, uh, the magnetic field which goes inward is now being dragged in the eastward direction. And so this is plotted here in a face-on view towards the surface of the sun. And now comes the really difficult part that Parker already imagined. And he calls those cyclonic events. Cyclonic events uh, we have on Earth, of course. It comes from cyclones. We also know that cyclones have the opposite orientation in the southern hemisphere. 
In the Northern Hemisphere, a cyclone would uh, work in such a way that you have here an updraft or a downdraft. It's easier to understand there's an updraft. An updraft would uh, lead to a motion upward, but into regions where the density is lower. That's because we have density stratification in the sun. And so because of this expansion associated with the, uh, with the lower density, you have an effect from the Coriolis force. This, uh, the sun is rotating in the counterclockwise direction, and that leads to a rotation of this loop in the clockwise direction, in the opposite direction because you're expanding, so that leads to a, a breaking you could imagine. But this leads now to a new component of the magnetic field, which has a direction in the poloidal direction, which you see more clearly in the side meridional plane view. So you see now that you have a similar loop as before, but it is around this loop here, and it is therefore at a lower location, lower latitude of the sun. And that explains an equatorward migration according to this pictorial picture. There was a mathematics to that, but the mathematics, uh, the mathematics explained the large-scale phenomenology, but it did not convincingly demonstrate at the time uh, the details behind some of the uh, hand-waving uh, arguments. He did not explicitly calculate uh, the uh, actual electromotive force. So this is Gene Parker, who um, received the Crawford Prize in 22 and died uh, unfortunately. He, the Crawford Prize was awarded him in, 20, in 2020, but there was corona time. He, the prize was not delivered to him in person, but his son picked up the prize, and so um, and his uh, partner saw it actually uh, with his own eyes. But he died in uh, 22, unfortunately. It's a little bit uh, weird, but I need to talk for you. So to understand, um, to understand the uh, difficult, difficulty in acceptance at the time, uh, why it took so uh, many years before the community could finally accept this idea of, uh, of Parker's. Uh, let me illustrate this with the following uh, interesting observation. There was a paper by Shantasekai just a year after Parker's uh, important discovery. <clears throat> and he explained the origin of the Earth's magnetic field in terms of um, uh, fluid motions that could lead to the decay being much, much slower than in the absence of motions. So it can lead to a decay time. This is not a generation, it's a decay. But if the decay is very, very slow, then in that case, um, one could ex imagine that the origin of the Earth's magnetic field, which is steady uh, and not oscillatory, it could be a, basically a primordial magnetic field, and you would move the explanation for the magnetic field into some unknown past where a magnetic field was pre existing for some reason, and it could still be existing today. That was his imagination. And I find this remark remarkable because Parker had a very close as uh, association with Parker, and there is this famous uh, quote or uh, in, uh, entry in, in Wikipedia, which explains uh, that the difficulty of Parker's uh, solar wind. Parker made many, many discoveries. One of them had to do with the solar wind. Um, and this was also not uh, accepted by the, not only the, just the community, but the referees. And uh, it was John Seca who was close enough to Parker. He believed in Parker's explanation as, um, as because he communicated uh, these explanations to him in person. And so uh, Chandra Seca overruled the uh, referees in those years, and that is a remarkable uh, uh, fact, which led to the uh, publication of this important and very correct uh, discovery by Parkas. Magnetic uh, dynamo action um, has been I mentioned magnetic. Uh, I mentioned dynamo action in the, in terms of uh, a bicycle dynamo or even the self-generated dynamos. But there have been self-generated dynamos also working with fluid motions, and this is not straightforward because uh, 
fluid motions are, uh, this means uh, the entire body is homogeneously conducting. It's different from an, a, an actual dynamo design, which where you have to make wires in lo certain locations. If you imagine having your wires, but you put everything into a liquid sodium, everything would be conducting and the concept of a wire wouldn't make any sense anymore. So that's the big difference between a homogeneous dynamo uh, as in astrophysical settings and uh, the one in, uh, in the, in the, um, for engineering purposes. So the very first dynamo experiments were done in 2000. They were based on liquid sodium, which uh, sodium becomes liquid at a temperature of 100 centigrade. Uh, but in this case, uh, sodium was pumped along certain pipes uh, which had helical motions. The presence of helicity is not actually critical to a magnetic field generation, but it certainly helps in lowering the excitation conditions, by which I mean the critical velocity above which the critical velocity of the liquid sodium in the pumps above which dynamo action occurs. This was actually then measured with this design. This was a successful experiment. It led to magnetic fields up to 200 Gauss in this experiment. So this was an experiment which had these tubes. Each of these tubes is rotating the fluid in the same sense. So there's the same, of hand, same sense of handedness in the entire domain with 52 tubes. A magnetic field is generated once uh, the pump rate in meters cubed per hour is large enough. And there's a critical value. It's not very sharp in this case. And this has a very good reason. And it's also not even symmetric. You would expect that the excitation of positive and negative magnetic fields should be equally easy. But the reason for that is that this is what is called an imperfect bifurcation, which has to do with the fact that the magnetic field measurement happens in an environment where there is already an external magnetic field, namely the Earth's magnetic field of half a Gauss. You cannot avoid that. And therefore, one particular direction is slightly preferred uh, compared to the opposite direction, but the difference is getting smaller uh, as the dynamo becomes more supercritical. There's other experiments uh, of the dynamos that go back uh, that um, go back to the same time already in some cases. Here, for example, is uh, the dynamo that is called the Riga experiment, which was a fluid pumped also with a helical motion, but in just a single cylinder, and there was a return flow. There was some analytic, analytic theory for some similar design, which was called the Ponomarenko dynamo. Uh, and it also led to a magnetic field generation in the same year. But the, all these motions had fairly constrained uh, fluid motions because of the fact that the flow motion was only in these cylinders. This was just a proof of concept and very different from astrophysical designs. In order to go a little bit closer to uh, something more natural, uh, there was this experiment in Kalarash where one is building the ITER uh, nuclear reactor, or the fusion reactor rather, uh, but they have a lot of liquid sodium, of course, at, a, at their dispersal. They also did an experiment which is driven here by motions, by propeller motions on, this, on the two sides of the cylinder. They rotate in opposite direction and bring the entire motion also into a slow motion. This also led to magnetic field generation, uh, which is not fully understood. There is uh, some issue with the potential magnetization of the of the, of the impellers that are being used on the on the sides. And yet another a very interesting design that is on the horizon for calculating this is uh, this design here, which has which is a, a, a cylinder which is inclined which is rotating around this axis, but everything is on a rotating table. And imagine such a huge, uh, highly design where you are uh, rotating in two opposite directions. This leads to a lot of energy input into this design. And by the way, if you put a lot of energy into such a, a liquid, which is then also being um, magnetized, it leads to the loss of energy through the production of uh, joule heating. And so this joule heating is extremely uh, important, uh, even just in the Karlsruhe dynamo experiment. As I said, the liquid sodium, which also is used here, has to be made liquid 
uh, by heating it, of course. But once the dynamo is actually running, you don't need to heat it anymore. It automatically is being heated by itself. You just need to pump it. Oh, so here's an experiment uh, which is now not done uh, by uh, by a real experiment, by but by the computer instead. And what we see here is an animation of a magnetic field at the surface of a periodic domain. And here is shown the corresponding spectrum. So, uh, so the spectrum we see here is a, a visualization of the energy at different length scales or wave numbers. Small scales here, large scales here. This driving at small scales, which you saw a moment ago clearly, which comes, which explains this peak. And the black line is the kinetic energy, the red line is the magnetic energy. You see that the magnetic energy is actually growing. That is why it's uh, really done in this case a dynamo. I'll look it again. So we see also that there is now a special peak, an additional peak emerging. And that is uh, the peak out of which a large scale component can gradually emerge. So you saw that in the beginning, everything was just random, really random. There was no systematic orientation, but now you see larger and larger patches. And eventually you see that the largest possible scale of this periodic domain is being exploited. The fact that the magnetic field has a large scale component in this direction is a matter of chance uh, because the box is fully three dimensional. This direction could be any other of the three coordinate directions. But the fact that there is a coordinate direction emerging here is completely natural because the magnetic field is going to the largest scale of the domain. So everything does depend on the boundary conditions, which are periodic here. The shape of this magnetic field is such that one component uh, has, a sinus, has a certain sinusoidal variation, and the other component perpendicular to, to this direction is 90 degrees phase shifted. And so if you take the curve of this vector, you find the same uh, a parallel magnetic field vector. It's also zero sine uh, kx times cosine kx. And so this is an example of a fully helical magnetic field that is being generated at large length scales. On small scales, of course, it is also still helical. The, trust, uh, the presence of helicity plays some important role in some dynamos, but as I said already, I will come in a moment to also these uh, discussing dynamos that are non-helical. But nevertheless, magnetic helicity is a, an important concept. Magnetic helicity, it means that the magnetic field itself has a certain sense of, of handedness. Handedness uh, can be described by calculating any type of what is called a pseudo vector. The magnetic field uh, is the result of taking the curve of a vector, which is itself called the magnetic vector potential. And so if you take a dot product of a, uh, of a curve with, with its vector itself, you get a pseudo scalar. It means that the, orient the sign of this quantity would change if you looked at this experiment in a mirror. That is because one of the vectors uh, is not an actual vector, but it's an axial vector. Axial vectors are really having a handedness rather than an actual arrow. If you look at an arrow in a mirror, which of course would have the same direction, but that's not correct. You really should look at the handedness uh, with my hand. And if you look at that as a mirror, it really changes. And that's why uh, this cross product changes. The important part of this slide is to illustrate here that in the case of Magnetic helicity it weighs an evolution equation, which is similar to the magnetic energy equation. The magnetic energy equation is typically a balance between two terms, mainly. One of them is a generation term, which is work done against the Lorentz force, against because there's a minus sign. So you need to do work against the Lorentz force to drive the dynamo. And it dissipates by joule heating, which I mentioned already. And that leads to all the stuff being put into this magnetic field you get out in the form of heat. And that is also why uh, uh, this diffusion is an important thing because it makes this entire process irreversible. That's an important aspect why a dynamo works. Uh, in the case of the evolution equation for the magnetic helicity density, or at mean magnetic helicity density, this production term simply doesn't exist. And you do have a diffusion term, but it's uh, relatively unimportant. 
and to converge it actually to zero. And so therefore, magnetic helicity is not only just an interesting quantity, it's actually a very well conserved quantity. And even in the presence where this magnetic helicity would vanish on average, it actually still plays an important role in subvolumes. And that, that I will explain a bit later. And now I come to the uh, changing from the large scale dynamos to the much more ubiquitous small scale dynamos. The large scale dynamo has a turbulent spectrum. And what is shown here is the magnetic energy spectrum and the kinetic energy spectrum. Both of them are almost parallel. But the only difference is here at the large length scales, where we see that magnetic energy can exceed and strongly uh, produce a large scale structure, which is associated with an extra peak here in this ge Cartesian geometry, in a spherical geometry, you would have a different near geometry. Uh, but on the uh, but the rest of the magnetic field structure is rather similar. In both cases, we have a, uh, a certain cascade, as we call it, and much of the magnetic energy is being cascaded from large length scales because of nonlinear actions in interactions in smaller and smaller scales. The idea of the small scale dynamo came back, it went back to the uh, early work by Kazantsev. And Kazantsev had a um, mathematical model, which was not understood by many of the people in those years. And a really uh, much better understanding came from Russell Kulstreet and Anderson, but the mathematics and the equations are exactly the same. But he did it in completely, completely independently. He didn't know anything about the Kazantsev work and got the same equations, which are equations for the magnetic correlation or the magnetic energy spectrum, which look like this here. Uh, so there is an equation, not just for the mean magnetic field, but actually for the quadratic quantity of the actual magnetic field, which is finite. Uh, because even when a magnetic field is uh, completely can canceling each other, B squared would always be finite. And there's a diffusion term, but there can also be some generation that leads to a certain spectrum. Uh, here's the wave number and its magnetic energy spectrum. And the slope he derived already is equal to k to the three halves power, which is also called the Kazantsev slope. In this case, also a pictorial understanding was proposed, but as I said already, it is of limited use. But let me explain this anyway. The idea of such a dynamo is that you have a loop of magnetic field, which you can now modify by stretching it like this. This is why it's the first step is stretch. But then you tilt it into an H-shaped figure through twisting. And there you need the three-dimensionality of the motion. Then after that, you can fold this eight-like uh, figure into this kind of structure, which looks after melting, after connecting these overlapping, these crossing flux ropes into one, you can merge it into a structure which looks qualitatively similar to the original one, but with an important difference, namely the fact that in this case, you have two loops that uh, therefore double the magnetic flux. The magnetic flux is the magnetic field integrated over a cross-sectional surface. That does not uh, change as you stretch this magnetic field line because stretching means the cross-section becomes smaller, but the strength becomes larger. So flux is conserved, and it really becomes doubled by the overlaying of these two different structures. This picture also shows why it's so important to have magnetic diffusion, because otherwise you wouldn't have this merging fact. Here you see numerical visualizations of this Kazantsev spectrum. And an important um, fact is that this uh, Kazantsev spectrum is something that occurs in the spectral range toward the right of the inertial range. Spectra, and I'll explain it in a moment, uh, have both an inertial range and a sub-inertial range, which is the magnetic uh, structure to the left, which is much more better resolved in this picture here. I will uh, uh, come to that in a moment, but uh, let me explain one thing. Many observers want to understand, can we see any of the particular details that are being uh, proposed here? And yes, 
very busy observation of the interstellar medium, we have a lot of possibilities to look at um, signatures of the magnetic field. In particular, linear polarization, Q and U are being uh, are, are three of uh, two of the four different polarization modes, the Stokes spectrum. And these two modes, and many people in cosmology uh, know that, can be converted into what is called E and B, which are rotationally invariant quantities. The problem with this uh, linear polarization is if you look at um, and a, a frame which is rotated by a certain amount, you interchange Q and U. And so it's not frame invariant. But E and B are, and what they mean is um, a decomposition of the polarization vectors that we see here from a, a Planck picture. Uh, well, I think it was a W map picture into the emotes. And uh, uh, so the emotes mean a decomposition into Completely, completely mirror symmetric parts, which are ring-like and star-like uh, star -like, uh, field orientations. And of course, uh, the um, uh, spiraling parts, which can be in two different forms. And this is a mirror image of this. So that corresponds to a B, which is changing its sign in the position of the mirror. And so this decomposition is routinely used in cosmology. But it's not really used in much of astrophysics in uh, the solar medium. In fact, it wasn't even um, noted at, in the beginning when the cosmologists uh, discovered a certain excess um, or the existence of depolarization, uh, which they associated with the existence, falsely, uh, with the existence of gravitational waves. They could also change uh, depolarization to depolarization, but that was not the reason for their observation. In fact, what uh, was, the observe, was observed was the foreground of our own galaxy. So our galaxy itself produces both E and D polarizations. But we can use it also as an important diagnostic. Here, for example, we see the different signs. and different structures of the EM polarization. So a turbulent spectrum has important uh, structures like an inertial range and a sub-inertial range. And, uh, and, we, <coughs> and we can ask ourselves, uh, how uh, do these spectra change under different uh, physical conditions? And I uh, distinguish here two different cases. The one is driven turbulence, as opposed to what is called decaying turbulence, which I haven't mentioned yet. But if decaying turbulence does play an important role in various uh, important applications. For example, in much of the evolution of the universe, the magnetic field uh, could have been produced early on, but it would then only be decaying and cannot be amplified by the fluid motions. But the uh, concept of dynamos still plays a role and changes evolution. So here is, um, first of all, shown a picture, familiar picture. We see here, we, we saw that from this picture here, we see here this power spectrum, and we saw the gradual buildup of the magnetic field at large links to this. In decaying turbulence, uh, there's different situations invisible. One of them is where the initial magnetic field is fully helical. Another one is the fluid motions, where it doesn't matter whether it's helical or not. Helicity really plays an important role, especially for the magnetic field and not for the fluid motions. But we could have magnetic fields that are non helical on average, and still the magnetic helicity can play an important role in flashes. That is leading to this. You see, there is a difference in both, both cases, the spectra are similar, but it involves here underneath an envelope which has a certain inclination. The question is where does all of that come from? Magnetic fields we now know, or strongly believe, do exist in much of the universe on average. There is some uh, controversy still, but the observational evidence for that comes <clears throat> from the non-observation of the uh, secondary photons that would be produced by the interaction between uh, extremely energetic, energetic TeV photons in the, you know, that are being emitted from, uh, from lasers. Uh, but they would interact with the um, extragalactic background light and would produce GeV energy photons whose energy it does not agree with what one theoretically expects. And that can be explained by the presence of an intervening magnetic field, 
that would lead to the departure of positrons and electrons uh, in opposite directions and so would prevent the forward cascade towards the GEV forward photons. So that all plays an important role in the early universe, and we're not going to get those details here. There are various mechanisms that can motivate uh, either during inflation or during the electroweak phase transition the existence of magnetic fields. But those would decay in a particular way with a particular signature, and that can be plotted here by uh, looking at a similar diagram, which I showed before, where we have length scale and magnetic field, and different magnetic field configurations, whether helical or non-helical, could lead to different uh, trajectories. There's now, you see some uh, complicated mathematics here, there's not time to explain that, of course, here, but uh, the presence of magnetic helicity led uh, on these very simple dimensional arguments to an understanding of how a length scale, as a function of time, uh, can be, uh, how the power uh, can evolve. And so simply on dimensional grounds, when you understand that A dot B, the magnetic density, does play a role, then this has a dimension of centimeter cubed by second squared. In order to get a length scale, you have to raise it to the one third power. And that leads to a remaining time dependence, which is uh, seconds to the minus uh, two third power, which you then need to compensate by an explicit T factor. Which has a dimension, which has a corresponding dimension. And so uh, this entire expression has the uh, dimension of the length. So, therefore, length scale expand this time as t to the plus two third power. But there can be other conservation laws. And the important one is what I call here the Hosking integral, which plays a role in the situation where we have patches of magnetic helicity in different locations, but a vanishing average. So this has all been numerically uh, not only verified, but actually been uh, found before it was theoretically understood by Hosking. Hosking's work was in uh, 21 only, but these numerical simulations showed the presence of uh, this envelope. And what you see here is that at the very smallest event scales, wave numbers, there's actually an increase of the spectrum magnetic energy. And that's what we call an inverse cascade. That means, and that's important in cosmology, magnetic fields that are being produced by these various mechanisms that would typically be of very small length scales. And that's uh, often not what we observe. We want to explain larger length scales. Still, they can be interpolated in the regular, but not of the length scale of an AU uh, at the present time after all this expansion, but more of kiloparsec size. So the much of this has been uh, confirmed. This Hosking integral plays an important role. This idea has also played a role in neutron stars, uh, where we can have, where we actually have different mathematics, and that's because the dimensional arguments are being modified in neutron star crust. This is here work by Peter Goldweig and uh, Andreas Weisnecker, uh, who discovered that the magnetic field evolution in the crust can be described by an equation which is not linear. It has uh, not a U cross B. But it has a j cross b, and it therefore, or the curve b of times b, so it's non linear. Um, it's decaying the magnetic field, but the dimension of the magnetic field is not anymore a centimeter uh, per second, but centimeter squared per second. That's because uh, there's the diffusion here in this case balancing this generation term. This leads to, and uh, can be reproduced, to lead also to with theoretically expected evolutions of helical magnetic fields, non helical magnetic fields, exactly with the details as expected by modifying the dimensional arguments. So, let me now come to the, the uh, conclusion. I've uh, covered the, the grounds going from the idea of understanding the generation of magnetic fields in contemporary settings, like the Earth, for example, like, uh, like the Sun, but also. The evolution of magnetic fields uh, in much of the later universe. We have generation mechanisms uh, that can be of different types. I can go into those details. But once they are being generated, they follow very straightforward mathematics uh, that has been discovered only in recent years. And they can be understood in terms of dimensional arguments by realizing that the conserved quantity in the case of the Hosking integral has a certain dimension. And uh, that can be reproduced in great detail. So this uh, has led to lot, lots of uh, excitement 
in the community of uh, turbulence physics or magnetic fields play an important role. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Axel. Questions? Uh, regarding the Earth's field, you said it was relevant that um, iron is slowly falling through the uh, blue. Yes. Uh, towards the center. Uh, now, that suggests that eventually the magnetism of the Earth will die down. Uh, what's the time scale expected for that? I think this is on the order of a thousand years. Uh, the travel time. Uh, between a fluid parcel from the uh, from the surface uh, to the bottom of the core, uh, I think it's a thousand years. Oh, but the the, the time scale for the Earth to remain uh, magnetic must be much longer than that. Yes, uh, no, it's also not so much longer, but it's on the order of ten to four years. So the magnetic diffusion time that's uh, on the order of ten to four years. Yes. Oh, but. Um... But we've had magnetism on the Earth much longer than that. Well, oh, yes. Longer. Yes. yes. No. So, therefore, this idea, of course, this value, uh, is, uh, this, uh, the, so Parker, uh, you, uh, uh, maybe you're referring to the um, Chandrasekhar interpretations in those early years, who mm -hmm. was saying that maybe the ex uh, existence could be explained by a very longly prolonged. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this was an idea that made actually still sense, even with this correct diffusion time of 10 to 4 years. Uh, in the presence of suitable fluid motions, the decay could be for very special artificial fluid motions really be on the order of uh, uh, something like a, a million years, a billion years. But that would still not be quite enough because the Earth of the age of the Earth is five billion years, of course. So we really actually, so this idea was not correct. We really need a dynamo, and the dynamo is exactly what produces and maintains the magnetic field on time scales of uh, 10 to 4 years. So it really generates it really all the time. And there is significant losses uh, all the time also. So it's not a, a free game. It's, uh, you put a lot of energy in and you lose a lot of energy through heat. Thanks. Yes. So I'm not sure how this is, but when you were talking about neutron stars, what is giving you diffusion terms there? Because since you have superfluid there, you don't really have viscosity. So what's acting as a diffusion? So the, uh, first of all, I was talking about a crust in this case. Oh, okay. So the crust actually uh, means everything is somewhat different. Uh, you don't have real fluid motions at all. It's actually solid state physics. And what you have is the motion of electrons. And the electrons move in a, in a grid. And therefore, the ions are immobile. Uh, that leads to this uh, very peculiar evolution equation. Uh, and there we do have a uh, moment diffusion. This has been calculated. It's a complicated function of temperature also. Um, and uh, and yeah, so we do have this uh, cascade, which, uh, which can be predicted. One of the ideas, of course, of understanding the existence of a dipolar magnetic field, I didn't have time to go into those details, um, is that a, it would be the result of inverse cascading also. So we start off with small, very small scale, uh, small scale generation from a from the time when the magnetic field was actually generated. Uh, and this happened at another stage. <clears throat> Many people believe that the magnetic field in a neutron star is a result of a collapse, but that cannot be really correct. And we, the reason is uh, that of course this, the neutron star is collapsing, but at the same time. It is uh, producing a lot of uh, neutrino heat, and that leads to convection uh, by, uh, because of the neutrino opacity. Uh, the star is very hot, there's a lot of opacity uh, from neutrinos, and uh, this leads really to convection, which is turbulent motions. Turbulent motions certainly lead to turbulent diffusion, which is an enhancement of the, of the diffusion. So if you wanted to produce it by collapse, you can produce it, but you would lose it at the same time, unless you have a dynamo mechanism operating also in these neutron stars at the very early times. And early times means you in the first half minute of the life of a photo neutron star. That's the time when the convection uh, would have undergone something on the order of 10 to the 5 turnover time. So it's a lot of time uh, on these very small length scales. And that would be enough to produce a magnetic field. But it might be a small scale magnetic field. And then this small scale magnetic field would and afterwards inversely cascading through the process I just explained. That was the idea. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, so you must have big problems when you look at the you can see a smaller uh, scale, you yes. have a lot of these broad scales. Um, as long as the, uh, the, the spectrum is steep enough, that's, that's smaller than the case. But uh, my question is regarding the rate of these other energies, and how it depends uh, on your drive of turbulence, whether it is something idle or aggressive, and how that changes the rate at which you accumulate these energies here, but that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are talking about the, the turbulence itself, uh, which can be compressive or uh, something idle or or irritation, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, okay. compression or solenoidal. Um, in this case, um, because what that has been the UK has not been studied much in detail, uh, but as far as I would expect, uh, the decay would not show inverse cascading, and it would follow what I showed here with the blue lines all the time, where you have a magnetic field which is uh, the seminal range stays fixed and does not improve as the magnetic in the magnetic case, and you just have a decay from the uh, high gate numbers. That's what I would expect. And the um, you mentioned also something about the slope of the subinertial range. Yes, yes and that does not play an important role. And as far as the magnetic field is concerned, that has also been studied in just recent time, uh, times. It is important that it has increased at least as far as came to the three half power, which is interestingly just the same slope as what we have from the Lorenzo slope. If the um, if the slope is less than that, there would be no inverse cascading. But even for a case third spectrum, we now expect there to be inverse cascading, which is um, something which is difficult to observe, but has now been uh, in it, uh, has been in indications from the number of estimations have been that is possible. So you would have a big generation. And then, as I said already, it comes from the patches of the magnetic PCD, which drops in sign that is for vanishing average. So, uh, can you please explain why diffusion is so important for dynamo? Because ah. I speculate that if yes. diffusion is very strong, then it will suppress yes. that, uh, the, any action, right? Yes. So the uh, this question is uh, very interesting and still, I would say, somewhat controversial among the aspects. One of my arguments uh, why magnetic diffusion really is important is uh, the following. And I must make a very important distinction here between a magnetic field um, that is being evolving in the limit where the magnetic diffusivity goes to zero, as opposed to the situation which is artificial, where it is strictly zero and not, a, not just a limit. So if it's strictly zero, there is actually a, a very simple solution to the induction equation. The induction equation, you just have curl u cross b, and you can express it and what is known as Euler potentials. Two Euler potentials, one is called alpha, the other one is called beta. The magnetic field is written as the cross product of the gradients of these two potentials, gradient of alpha cross gradient of beta. And the evolution equation for both alpha and beta are simply attraction. So now uh, you have a very, very simple way of uh, making an experiment by being sure that you really don't have any diffusion because uh, this whole formalism wouldn't even work in the presence of diffusion. And the answer is uh, for flows where we know we have dynamo action, with this formulation, you don't get dynamo action under any of the circumstances. So it's, uh, it's a direct violation of uh, numerical. Uh, of, of the numerical findings of dynamo action. Nobody has been able to find a dynamo with these, uh, what is known as Euler potentials. So that's my uh, strongest argument. One finds, uh, incidentally, also still exponential growth for a certain amount of time. But it's not an eigenfunction. I should have explained, maybe, or in this context, it's important to understand uh, the magnetic field generation uh, is an eigenvalue problem. Uh, the magnetic field has a factor e to the lambda t and an eigenfunction. If you just take the magnetic field and wind it up, you actually don't have an eigenvalue problem because uh, even though the magnetic field might be exponentially growing, the structure of the magnetic field is constantly changing. You're producing smaller and smaller structures. And so you can never write this as a product of an eigenfunction times an exponential factor. So these are uh, my arguments why you need to uh, 
On a more pictorial level, I think uh, the simple answer would be you need to have some means of um, reproducing irreversibility. If you do any of these magnetic field line foldings, and I said it's a bit of a dangerous concept, uh, you can always undo it by doing just the opposite. And the magnetic field would automatically uh, undo itself if it only could. So that's another you know, more simple yeah, picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. So as you talk about small scale nanoparticles, I think cascades converted to larger scale. Somebody will solve that. So can you uh, speak up a little bit? The last one is that at some point your inverse cascade stops if you go to larger and larger scales. So yes, we find that's the domain, right? Yeah, well, in your box because of the domain. The box, yeah. In reality, you may need an additional influx of the design. Yeah. Yes, right. Is yeah. there any new understanding on this in terms yeah. of these pockets that you were mentioning before? So, the, in the case, for example, of the neutron stars, I was originally very hopeful that you could explain uh, really the all the way down to producing a, a dipole. So, you start with a certain amount of uh, degree of L of, uh, of uh, 40, for example, or even 100, and you would go down all the way to L equals 1, right? That's a function of time. And that would produce a light bulb. And um, that was my thinking. Uh, now we have done uh, some numerical experiments, and we see it actually stops earlier. And the reason is uh, that the magnetic field evolution is only possible in this cross. And the cross has a thickness, which itself corresponds to a certain amount of degree or a wave number, uh, which is less than L equals one, much less. And it's more like um, actually L equals 30 or something like that. So it's high. And so, um, I have some, uh, begin to have some worries that maybe that cannot because of this constraint. And that maybe that answers actually your question. Could uh, you go all the way down to L equals one in the case of this region star? Of course, in the um, in the three dimensional isotropic uh, universe, uh, you have all the three directions by like and you don't have an aspect ratio problem. And then, um, and then there's actually a, a in principle no limit. You can go all the way to it, but you need it very long times, of course. So we have only uh, 14 billion years in the evolution of the uh, decaying magnetic field. But there's no limit. So you can to go to larger and larger length scales if you just have the time to wait. You don't have that time now. It's 14 billion years. It's already all you had. Right? So I know this was an important realization. I know a friend of mine, a kind of one, Mr. Romania, was doing analytic calculations. I was looking for a stationary state. And then he didn't find the inverse, um, the, the, uh, the large scale magnetic field part until he realized, oh, this does not compile with my assumption of a steady state because it is constantly evolving. The peak is constantly going to large and large and great scale. We have seen in the simulations that it stopped, but that was because the periodic domain had a certain size of being. If it didn't, uh, up infinitely big space, there would be no separation. Would go to large and large length scales. It's, and, it's, and in this case, unlike the case of a, of a dynamo which is driven from the fluid motion, in this case, the fluid motions are driven by the magnetic field. So they really continue to large and large length scales. The energy is still decaying. Energy is still decaying, but the length scale is increasing and uh, in such a way that uh, magnetic uh, energy P square multiplied by the correlation lengths uh, is a constant. The length goes like T to the the energy decays like two to the minus p star, the product is constant. And that has to do with what is known as the uh, real space magnetic um, realizability condition. So the magnetic helicity is a conserved quantity, uh, that, with that uh, example that I just mentioned. And so it can never, uh, the magnetic helicity can never exceed the product of p squared times an x squared. So both of them are decaying or subject to this constraint. And that means you have to get this to sub law. The one is again exactly like the other one story. Does that actually answer your question? Yeah, I think that's probably online. Yes, right. Okay. Very good. Okay, that's uh, last question. Mm -hmm. uh, is my understanding correct that uh, the fluid motion is generated on large scales, and then there is a cascade to the smaller scales, come uh, of turbulence, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then uh, the energy is converted to magnetic field, and uh, it is an inverse case. Yes, right. Yes. And uh, is this correct? What, what is uh, the small scale where the energy 
Yes, yes. So we have um, um, we have a long cascade. The cascade is terminating towards small length scales because of the presence of the magnetic diffusion for the magnetic field. Uh, that is what sets the end of it. Um, and there will always be forward cascading. Uh, the inverse cascading is a fraction of this, which goes to larger scales. But it would not be uh, really in such a way that it would have to go back uh, all the way to the smallest scales and then back again. I don't think that's a, that's a useful picture. But we have constantly, at each from each length scale, an inverse cascading to larger scales. Uh, so it's a local transfer. That's why it's called a cascade. Really cascade, not from uh, not locally from one bank to the largest possible scale, but really stepwise. And they uh, both the forward cascade and the inverse cascade happen uh, simultaneously. And so it ultimately leads to the uh, growth in this case of the smaller shape numbers, which is the uh, dramatic difference you see for magnetic field of motion. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. uh, almost, uh, almost. Yeah, yeah I just uh, was curious about the, the scale, the length scale, which uh, uh, yeah, this cascade, uh, the inverse cascade starts. Mm -hmm. Say the Earth is a few thousand kilometers. Okay, right. So maybe the, uh, this actually is uh, getting to some uh, tricky aspects where one has not maybe uh, checked this carefully. So uh, I, my, I was answering the question in such a way that the transfer happens on all length scales, both through the inertia, entire inertia range, and then uh, also further to the left. Um, but this is something that is I have not been thoroughly uh, checked. This is my understanding at the moment, that the transfer happens really at all length scales, simultaneously with the forward cascade. But um, it was an interesting aspect to uh, verify that rigorously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, let's thank Axel for a wonderful day.